Hi, I'm Fernando Pereira, and today I shall introduce the notion of a data flow analysis. This family of static analysis is perhaps the most used form of static analysis in compilers in general, so I hope this class will be useful to you. And there are many kinds of static analysis that can be described as data flow, and we will see some of them in this class. Something that's very important about them is that they are all flow sensitive. Do you know what that means? Well, basically, this family of data flow analysis consider the order in which instructions exist in the program. The relative order between them is important to the results of the analysis. This importance comes from dependence relations. That means that some instructions depend on others. But what does it mean for an instruction to depend on another? To explain this notion of dependency, let's consider two instructions. The first two in this example. This arrow on the right side indicates a dependency between them. Whenever we have two instructions, so that the second uses some variable defined in the first, then we say that the second instruction depends on the first. In this particular example, the variable percent %cmp is causing this dependency. Do you see why? Because these dependencies are so important, data flow analysis are typically implemented in some data structure that is expressive enough to encode the program's control flow graph. Notice that we do not really need the CFG to run a data flow analysis. We can do it just with the syntax of the instructions. Yet, Having the CFG is useful because it gives us many ways to speed up the resolution of the analysis, as we will see later in this course. For instance, we can run the analysis on the loops that form the CFG instead of running them on the entire program. But that's enough with abstract concepts. Let me show you a concrete example of a data flow analysis, and then everything will be clearer, I hope. As an example, I would like to derive some data flow information from this program. We will represent this program via its CFG. Here on the right is the CFG of our target program. So I would like to answer the following question. How many registers do I need to compile this program? In other words, I would like to perform register location on this program. To get the necessary information to the register allocation, we will need to run a data flow analysis. This analysis will give us the information to know when we can store two variables in the same register and when such is forbidden. This data flow analysis that gives us this kind of information is called liveness analysis. We say that a variable Call it V is alive at a certain program point P if there is a path from P to a program point where V is used. And along this path, we do not meet any redefinition of V. And a variable should be stored somewhere at every program point where this variable is alive. In other words, if a variable is alive at a program point P, then this variable must reside in a register or in memory, I mean, any physical location at that program point. That is to say that the variable needs a location. Now, I wish you could stop the video for a moment and then think a bit about the second condition. Why is it really necessary? What would happen if the variable were redefined? To understand a bit better the answer to that last question, uh, let's try to see where variables are alive in our original program. Can you try to fill up these sets on the edges with the question marks? With the variables that you think are alive at those points, you can stop the video to think about this problem if you want. For instance, which variables are alive at this point here in the red box? It's hard to answer this question without looking at the entire program. But let me simplify the question. Is there any variable that you know for sure that it's alive at that point? Well, variable x must be alive there because it's used right after. So there's a path from the program point 
until we use of x that does not pause in definition of x. Same thing is true for y. So all the variables used at the instruction are alive right before that instruction. Indeed, this is true in general. If I have an instruction that uses a variable v, then v is alive before that instruction. I mean, immediately before. This adverb, immediately, is important because it means that there is no place for a redefinition of v along the way. This path is too short for this redefinition. But what about other variables? I mean, which other variables are alive right before some instruction? Well, we can try to think a bit, um, a bit about this problem iteratively. If a variable is alive after an instruction and it's not redefined by that instruction, then it's alive before the instruction. In other words, we have an information system in which information propagates backwardly along the directions of the edges in the program CFG. We call this kind of analysis a backward analysis. Now, what do we do about the join points? I mean, what about program points that have multiple successors? How do we compute the variables that are alive before a join point? We simply take the union of all the variables alive before the successors. To solve a data flow analysis, we need to store information somewhere. This information is like a map that maps program points with sets of live variables. For that, we associate with every program point two sets. We call them in and out. So in is the set of variables alive before a program point, and out the set of variables alive after that point. This means that for every program point we have two sets, and we consider in this case every instruction as a program point. So we shall associate with every instruction two sets, in and out. And when we solve the data flow analysis, we will have the sets filled with variables, the variables alive at those points. We can define the sets by means of equations. If we consider the equation for the inset, it's saying that the inset of a given instruction that defines a variable v and uses variables in expression e is built as follows. Any variable used in the instruction is alive before it. That's the first thing to know. Also, every variable alive after the instruction is alive before it. This, of course, unless the variable is defined by the instruction. In other words, an instruction kills variables that it defines. And to compute the outsets, we join the insets of all the successors. That's what this equation is saying. If you want, you can stop the video and take a look into the equations to try to understand what they say. Anyways, how do we solve these equations? We can solve them by simply evaluating them over and over until the in and out sets stop changing. That, of course, poses many questions. For instance, how are the in and out sets initialized? And how do we know that this algorithm would stop? I mean, our condition is iterate until the in and out sets stop changing. How do we know that eventually they will stop changing? Well, let's take a look into some examples before we try to answer those questions. So here you can see a program and the different equations that we have for this program. Notes that each in and out set gives us an equation. So we have twice as many equations as we have instructions in the program. Once we have the equations, we can even throw away the program. All that we need to solve the analysis is the system of equations. This is a very declarative way to describe an algorithm. The equations are the instances of the data flow analysis, and the solution to those equations is a solution to the data flow analysis. This is so declarative that we can solve these equations using some declarative programming language very easily. For instance, here on the right, the same set of equations, this time written in Prolog, a declarative programming language. Uh, don't worry, you don't have to know Prolog to follow this course. But perhaps just for the sake of it, 
you want to stop the video and then see if you can find some correspondence between the equations on the left and the right sides of the figure. Just to help you out, here's a correspondence between the original equations and its version written in Prolog. Again, don't worry, you don't have to know Prolog in this course. This is just to show you that the set of equations gives us, indeed, a true program. If you want, you can stop the video again and try to figure out why these two notations describe the same thing. And mind it that I can even run the prologue equations. We have four program points in our example. I'm calling them 1, 2, 3, and 4, the integers 1, 2, 3, and 4 in prologue. So I can check what are the in and out sets associated with each program point. But if you check the solution of the prologue equations, you will see that they correspond to the expected solution of the Leibniz analysis. And then, we, with all these new concepts that you've learned, perhaps you want to take a look into the original example again. Could you try to solve Leibniz analysis for this example? I'm sure you could, but just in case, here's the solution of Leibniz analysis for this example. You can stop the video and check that the results are indeed correct. And this discussion closes our first class about data flow analysis. There is still much to see and in the next classes we will talk about different kinds of data flow analysis. Until there, feel free to write me with questions or comments.